as usual, another great guest, but a quick diversion. You'll notice that our full name is the Marketplace for Health, Wealth, and Freedom. Well, let's talk about your health for a moment. If you'd like to escape from the stranglehold of insurance and be able to see alternative doctors or go across state lines for care, then you definitely need to take a look at patientempowerment.mpb.health and see if that's the fix you've been looking for. Now, let's get back to the show. Welcome, folks, to Freedom Hub. I'm Charlie Froman, and I'm joined, as always, with, with, by Jim Graypeck, the entrepreneur behind the pavilion. The Thursday weekly show is more wide open than our Wednesday weekly show, which is more health-focused. And Dan Pilla is a returning guest. We had him a year ago or two. We may have even had him like three or four years ago in our early days with Jeff Cantor. And I never want him to stop coming back because as you read in my promo for today's event, it seems to me it's kind of insane that a supposedly modern society would tolerate taxation of what we earn. Uh, I know there's all kinds of demagoguery about fairness, blah, blah, blah. But any economist will tell you that you could raise sufficient revenue taxing sales. It's more consistent. And it doesn't come with all of the tyranny and the hassle. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I can't stand keeping records to prove my income. And I'm a gig worker with different revenue streams. Uh, my tax guy has all these quarterly tax payment letters for me to submit. Maybe I'll miss a couple. Maybe I won't submit any of them. And then my tax meeting on April 15th is, is a nightmare. Um, I don't want to have to keep records for the government to collect revenue. You know, why can't we just see the percentage on your sales receipt? And, you know, it's visible. Everyone pays the same rate. So this anger <laughs> I have goes back to 1995 when I was a Republican congressional staffer. And I was pretty aggressive looking for all of the more reformist issues for all of the issues I handle. I handled health care, so I was neck deep in Hillary care, and I had tax for some reason. And our new majority leader was an economist, Dick Armey. And he had all the tax LAs assemble in the Capitol, and he was going to debate his nice postcard flat tax, which would, we, would be an improvement over the status quo. But here was this new guy, Dan Pilla, and he was going to say, why waste the effort to flatten the income tax? Let's just junk it and have a national retail sales tax. A friend of his, Steve Hayes, would lobby me in my congressional office. He would, he would come a lot because I guess you know, the word got out that I wanted to meet all the harder core lobbyists. You know, there were people that wanted to do cross guarantees for banking. There were so many great ideas out there, and I wanted to help them all. Because, you know, the more I was in D.C., the more I realized, like any sensible person, it was a cesspool. It was a pig trough for special interest. That's all it is. Um, it's, you know, a tool for the highest bidder. It's, it's dangerous. And so the retail, national retail sat retail sales tax proposal morphed into what's called the fair tax. I think, you know, Daniel, tell me, I think it had some momentum 10 or 15 years ago with some bill that got a lot of votes, a lot of co-sponsors. I don't know really the history, um, but then the momentum died. You know, a lot of tea partiers were pushing it. There's a bill now in Congress, HR 25, I think, which has a dozen or so co-sponsors. But, you know, we have a lot of frustration out of COVID. People realize health freedom is critical. There's a lot of anger. People are waking up. But if they're going to wake up, we got to have a tax proposal that's going to be worth the effort. Um, and we'll talk about the history. You know, Woodrow Wilson, that globalist pawn, 1913 was the worst year in our history. We got settled by the income tax. We got the central banksters taking control of our society. We had direct election of senators, which removed state influence over the dynamic of all policy. So I think they all kind of tie together. And so uh, Dan runs taxhelponline.com. So he is a professional advisor for all of your problems with the IRS. 
He has uh, Tax Freedom Institute, which we'll discuss. And with that, Dan, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Charlie. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I do remember those uh, those days in the 1990s when uh, when we had the flat tax sales tax debates with the uh, with the Army team. We did I don't know how many of them, Charlie. We did a couple of them in Washington, and then there were a number of radio debates around the country. Very very uh, uh, numerous. I, I don't know. There were a couple dozen of them probably. But we debated this on radio all over the country, and and uh, and it did it did pick up some steam, and it lost the steam. I'll tell you precisely what. What took the wind out of the sails of the sales tax uh, of the sales tax debate, and that was the 1998 IRS Restructuring and Reform Act. This was the bill that was passed by Congress uh, that that grew out of the Senate Finance Committee hearings and IRS abuse. And you might recall, Charlie, that I testified before that committee as well and documented uh, about 13 specific ways that the IRS uses bluff and intimidation and misinformation and disinformation, in many cases outright lie to people concerning what their rights are. Actually, President Clinton formed that commission. And in retrospect, I didn't know this at the time, but looking back in retrospect, I believe he did that specifically as a way of taking the wind out of the sails of the radical tax reform ship that was picking up a lot of speed. Because once that restructuring act was passed and, the, and, and there were some good reforms that came out of it, no question about it. I was a consultant to the commission on restructuring the IRS and I made 33 specific recommendations to the commission on how to tweak this and tweak that. And a number of those things uh, were, made, it in, made it into the law. And, and so that, that was a good thing. But, but the point is that at that point forward, Almost nobody in Washington was willing to talk about reforming the tax system anymore because we fixed IRS abuse. We've got the Restructuring and Reform Act. There's no point in doing this any further. And I'm telling you, it just died. It died. It was. It was like. It was like the ultimate wet blanket that was thrown on the movement. In retrospect, I could see how that happened. At the time, we thought this was just another stepping stone on the road to radical reform. But as it turned out, that's not the case. So now we. Here we are 20 plus years later, and we've got a tax system that's as that, that's worse than, not as bad as, worse than it was in the 1990s insofar as compliance and administration is concerned. So what I want to talk about here today is, is, is the, 10, the 10 principles of sound tax policy that have to govern our thinking as we move forward with consideration of a new tax system. Now, Charlie, you raised the question, why aren't people thinking about this right now? And the answer is that some people are thinking about it. There's some noise that's being made in Georgia. Uh, I, I, spent, uh, I spent almost a week in, in Nebraska in January. I did uh, five or six public appearances talking about these 10 principles. I met with a number of state legislators. It's a unicameral legislature in Nebraska, so they call themselves senators. So I met with a number of state senators. There was a bill in the Nebraska legislature to abolish the Nebraska income tax. I provided testimony to that committee. Uh, I submitted some op-eds that got published around in, uh, in, in, uh, in Lincoln and some of, the other, uh, some of the other towns around. So there was some real good noise in Nebraska. Wisconsin is starting to stir just a little bit about tax reform. And believe it or not, in, this, in the leftist state of Minnesota, we now have a Republican candidate candidate for governor that's talking about abolishing Minnesota's income tax. So I'm going to be getting on board with that as well. So there is a little bit of noise out there. It's not the kind of noise we'd like to hear, but there is a little bit of noise out there about some reform. And so what I want to do is dish up what I think the 10 principles are that have to guide our thinking through this process. And number one on my list is simplicity. That, 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 one of, the, one of the basic fundamental rights that we have as American citizens is the right to due process of law. We have the right, citizens have the right to know what the law requires of them, and they have to have the ability to comply with the law in a simple and, uh, and, and, and uh, in a simple, simple and quick manner. And with the Internal Revenue Code, we've got exactly the opposite of a simple tax code. Our, our tax law now consists of more than 4 million words that were changed more than 5,900 times just since 
2001 alone. And to put this in perspective, in 2000, our tax code consisted of about 1.3 million words. So we've got exponential growth in the tax code here, and this creates the level of complexity that makes it virtually impossible for the average citizen to know and understand what the tax law is. And as a matter of fact, the National Taxpayer Advocate in her, in her 2016 annual report to Congress, five, six years ago now, it's worse now than it was then, has said that our code, our code has reached a point where it's hideously complex. Those are her words, not mine. Hideous uh, complexity that is into the Internal Revenue Code at this point in time. And as a matter of fact, in her annual reports to Congress, the National Taxpayer Advocate, ever since about 2002, uh, identified, identified tax law complexity as the number one most serious problem that taxpayers have in, in complying with the Internal Revenue Code. And, and, and this is, friends, this is this is a, a problem that, that we need to address. And every single year, Congress tells us we're going to have tax law simplification. There's never tax law simplification. It gets worse and worse and worse every year that goes by. So we need to consider legitimate simplification. And I'll tell you, an income tax by nature is not simple. We have to do something different if we're going to achieve true simplification where people have the, the capacity to comply with the law easily and quickly. Number two on my list is non-invasiveness. Non-invasiveness. We need a minimally invasive tax system so that people can comply without having to disgorge every aspect of their private lives. We've got a tax system that's based on income. That's the base that is taxed, is income. What that means is that in order to uh, in order to achieve full compliance with the income tax, the IRS has to know every single thing about your private life, where you work, where you spend your money, how you earn that money, who you associate with, all of your activities, because every single one of your private activities has a bearing on whether you had income that was not reported to the IRS. All right, the Internal Revenue Service has been engaged for the last 20 years in an ongoing push to get real-time access to every public and private database in the country so that they can establish what they call a front-end tax system. Now, I talk about this in my book, uh, the uh, How to Win Your Tax Audit. This front-end tax system is a a system under which the IRS has so much information about your private life in real time access that you don't even have to, uh, to uh, uh, file a tax return necessarily with the IRS. They've got the information, but how's that for tax simplification? We know everything there is to know about you. We've got all the information from public and private databases in real time. And so we can just essentially send you a bill for the tax that you owe. The compliance burdens, friends, are crushing America. We've got a situation where people, where, where American citizens spend millions of hours every year in the compliance process. And, and, and this is an invasiveness that is over the top. If we're going to establish true tax reform, we need a tax system that is minimally invasive. Citizens have, the, this is a two-way street. Compliance is a two-way street. Citizens have a responsibility to pay the tax that they owe in full and on time. The government has a responsibility to collect that tax in the least invasive manner. And they have, they have abdicated that responsibility in, in every way, shape, and form. Number three on my list is efficiency. Efficiency. The tax system should collect the revenue in the most efficient way. Now, the, uh, <laughs> the proponents of the current income tax system would tell you that the Internal Revenue Service is the most efficient government agency that we have because they actually collect trillions of dollars of revenue, about 3.5 trillion in revenue last fiscal year for the expenditure of about $12 billion in their budget. And when you do that division, you know, that seems like it's pretty efficient. It seems like they're collecting, you know, about $100 for every roughly 60 cents of money that's spent on the Internal Revenue Service. They turn in $100 worth of revenue. That seems pretty efficient, doesn't it? But the fact of the matter, friends, the system we have is the most inefficient way to collect the taxes. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the, the tax system that we have now uses 260 million different collection points. And when I talk about collection points, I'm talking about the, the specific 
points at which the revenue is collected. And when I'm when I'm when I say collection points, I'm talking about the income tax returns that are filed in 2021. Uh, for for uh, in in 2021. There were about 155 million individual tax returns filed and another 105 million business tax returns filed. That's 260 million collection points that the IRS has to reach to to collect that money. And so that is highly inefficient. That doesn't even talk about the, uh, the number of information returns that are filed. And this gets back to the question of, inv of invasiveness. Every year, more than three billion information returns are filed with the IRS. Last year was about 3.4 billion information returns. When you add in the income tax returns, we got 10 pieces of paper for every man, woman, and child in America that flood into the Internal Revenue Service. This is extremely inefficient. Now, here's the other dirty little secret that nobody ever talks about when we're talking about IRS efficiency or the efficiency of the tax system. The IRS says, well, we collect $3.5 trillion last year on just a budget of $12 billion. That's very inefficient. Efficient. No, you didn't. Three out of every five dollars collected by the IRS is not collected by the IRS. Three out of every five dollars paid into the Treasury is collected by businesses through wage withholding on their employees, and then it's paid into the Treasury. So we have every business in America that's an unpaid tax collector for the Internal Revenue Service. And so this is an extremely inefficient system. I alluded to the fact uh, a couple of minutes ago that the uh, that the uh, American people spend millions and millions of hours every year in tax law compliance, uh, making records, keeping records, filling out tax returns, responding to IRS enforcement actions. The IRS mails out about a, about a a hundred million letters every year to businesses and individuals regarding compliance issues. And so these letters have to be answered. People go through audits. There are millions of people that face collection actions, wage levies, bank levies, tax liens, property seizures. All of these things need to be handled. And this creates tremendous inefficiency. And we did a study years ago, early 1990s. And, and in fact, I talked about this at length during the Dick Army flat tax debates. And that is the compliance cost that never get discussed. And as a matter of fact, because of my work, the National Taxpayer Advocate started identifying compliance costs in her annual reports to Congress and tying a can to the fact that this is a tremendously expensive system to comply with. And we, we determined that the cost of compliance is about 65% of the tax burden. What that means is for every dollar you pay in taxes, it costs you another 65 cents to get it there. Now, friends, this is horrifically inefficient. All right. Now, the fact of the matter is that these expenses are loaded, disproportionately loaded on businesses. All right. Individuals that are filing short forms don't have a 65 percent uh, collection uh, uh, a compliance burden. But businesses are the ones that are carrying the load because of the complexity of the employment tax rules. So we have to get rid of the inefficiency in the system. And I will tell you this, friends, a flat tax does not do the job because a flat tax is still an income tax. It still requires the filing of tax returns. It still requires the filing of all these billions of information returns. As I said, about 3.4 billion W-2s and 1099s filed with the IRS. And a, and a flat tax is still an income tax requiring the IRS to still know everything about your life. So it doesn't meet the efficiency and it doesn't meet the invasiveness rules. Next on my list, number four, the number four uh, point in the 10 principles of a sound tax system is stability. The law should be stable from generation to generation. People should be able to know that what the law is today, the law is going to be tomorrow. And what the law is tomorrow, it's going to be 10 years from now. People have a right to plan their futures when it comes to their financial obligations and their financial planning particularly for businesses. Businesses have a right to know what their tax burden is going to be next year and 10 years from now so they can do the appropriate planning that is necessary to meet their obligations and to, and to uh, meet the expectations uh, of, of their investors and shareholders and so forth in the, in the marketplace. We have the most unstable tax system that you can possibly imagine, friends. In 19, in the, during the decade of the 1980s, from, from, from that 10-year period of time, there were three major tax laws that were passed by Congress. 
three of them. And that culminated in 1988 with the, uh, or 1986 rather, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, Tax Reform Act of 1986. That was President Reagan's attempt to start to phase in a flat tax system that made massive changes to the Internal Revenue Code. It did lower the brackets. It took us from seven or eight brackets down to three. And, and so, okay, one decade, we've got, we've got uh, three major tax law changes. In the 1990s, in the latter half of the 1990s, there were, there were three major tax laws that were passed in just three years, 96, 97, and 98. And the 1998 Restructuring Act was responsible for introducing 750 changes to the Internal Revenue Code, just that one act. But Congress was just getting warmed up. Starting in about 2001, as I said, between 2001 and 2019, there have been 5,900 changes to the Internal Revenue Code. In 2008, there were 500 changes alone in just that one year. All right, we've got a tax system now that's loaded up with, with, with temporary provisions, with phase-ins, with phase-outs. The entirety, friends, the entirety of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was passed by Congress under the President, uh, under the Trump administration, 100% of those changes, about 71 of them, phase out in two, they don't phase out, they expire in 2025. Every single one of those changes. And it's been 20 years now that American taxpayers have been tortured with these temporary and expiring tax provisions. This is the definition of instability, friends. And this is something that has got to change and it's got to change uh, radically if we're going to have a sound tax system. In, uh, in uh, 2005, uh, the president, uh, the, 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 there was a president's advisory panel on tax reform, and they talked about the stability of the tax code there. And, and uh, in, in, the, in the report of the uh, president's advisory panel in 2005, the report said, uh, this is a quote now, the tax system is both unstable and unpredictable. Frequent changes in the tax code, which often add to or undo previous policies, as well as the enactment of temporary provisions result in uncertainty for businesses and families. This volatility is harmful to the economy and creates additional compliance costs. We have got to have a stable tax system. And I'll tell you something, friends, you compare, and let's just take Minnesota as an example. As we said, there are 5,900 changes in the Internal Revenue Code in just that 20-year window. That, by the way, doesn't even account what happened in 2020 and 2021, which we, where we saw massive tax law changes introduced by Congress. In the state of Minnesota, our sales tax, our state sales tax, came into law in 1963. Friends, you can count on one hand the number of changes to the sales tax laws in the state of Minnesota during that window of time. We're talking about we're, we're, we're talking about 70 years. Is that 80 years? Uh, you know, do the math real quick. 1963, here we are, 2022. You can count on one hand the number of changes to our state sales tax laws. And the reason for that is because it, it plays into my next point, and that is because sales taxes consumption taxes are visible and income taxes are hidden. That brings me up to point number five on my list, visibility. The tax has to be visible, friends. The cost of government has to be apparent to every citizen. People need to know what they pay in taxes and they need to understand what this government is costing them because when they understand the real cost of the burdens, then they can start to legitimately push for, for restrictions on federal spending. As long as, as long as these taxes are hidden, people don't know what they're paying. I'll, I'll just give you an example. I deal with folks that are in trouble with the IRS all the time. And one of the things that we delve into is the question of, of how much taxes were paid in a given year. And, and the fact of the matter is, most people don't think they paid any tax at all. All right, I'll say, well, how much did you pay in taxes last year? And people say, well, I didn't pay anything, I got a refund. Oh, really? Is that true? So let's look at your W-2 form. That shows your wage withholding. Shows your wage, which wage withholding was $5,000. How much was your refund? Well, I got a $1,000 refund. Okay, you paid $5,000 in wage withholding. You got a $1,000 refund. Let me ask you again, how much did you pay in taxes last year? And then the hand hits the head. Oh, gee, I guess I paid four grand. Yeah, I guess you did. And friends, that doesn't even address the social security taxes. 
Most wage earners pay so if the Social Security tax is seven and a half percent, seven point six five percent of your wage income. If you're a W two wage earner, gets withheld from your paycheck by your employer and paid into Social Security taxes. You don't file a Social Security tax return. There are no Social Security tax audits. Uh, you you don't you don't have to uh, you know. Uh, send a check to the IRS for Social Security taxes. You do if you're self-employed, but not a wage earner. And most people don't realize that they're paying more in Social Security taxes than they are in income taxes because they never see the money. It's completely hidden. The Social Security tax system is completely hidden, as is the, the, the income tax system for the majority of citizens, because 85% of the people out there get a refund. So the tax system is hidden for those folks. I mean, let's put it to you this way. How many of us think in terms of gross pay versus net pay when we look at our paychecks? I mean, we've got an, we've got an entire culture that doesn't, that doesn't focus on the top line of their paycheck. They only focus on the bottom line and they pay no attention to the top line. What am I taking home? That's the only thing that matters. This is a hidden tax system, friends, and hidden taxes are always easy to raise and visible taxes are not easy to raise. This is why Minnesota's sales tax has changed uh, barely a half a dozen times in 70, 80 years, whereas the income tax laws are changing thousands and thousands of times during a, a 20 year period, 5,900 changes. Visible taxes are difficult to raise, invisible taxes are not. When you have invisible taxes, it's easy to blame increased costs on some third party. It's big business that did it. It's big oil. It's big tobacco. It's big energy. It's big this, this, or this. No, it's big government. And when you have visible taxes, it's easy to see that big government is responsible for the problem, not big something else. And so the next thing on my list, number six on my list, is neutrality. Taxes cannot fall more or less heavily on one segment of the society at the expense of others. One segment of business or industry at the expense of others. One of the reasons we have a remarkably complicated tax system, friends, is because our tax system is now being used to accomplish social goals as opposed to raising revenue. In fact, there's three things that are going on with our tax system that, are, that, are, uh, that, that, that the system is used for. Number one, Number one on the list is to, is to uh, implement somebody's definition of social justice, all right? The, the, the problem is the definition of social justice changes regularly, all right? Number two is the tax laws are used as, as congressional currency. Congress people, uh, senators buy and sell favors using the tax code as currency. And number three on the list is, oh, is to raise revenue. Oh, by the way, we should raise a little revenue with our, with our tax system as well. <laughs> and, 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 and the fact of the matter is that's the only thing that the tax system should be used for is raising revenue. And that means the system has to, the system has to have neutrality. It can't punish this segment or, 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 uh, or benefit that segment at the expense of, of some other segment. It's got to be neutral. Next thing on my list is economic growth. Taxes should not impede investment, friends. We need a tax system that does not impede investment. All right, now let's understand something. There, the, every tax system out there, whether it's an individual tax or, or an entire tax structure like our, like our income tax is, taxes cause distortions in the marketplace. All right, a distortion arises. Economists will refer to, to distortions as, as uh, factors that cause somebody to do something they otherwise wouldn't do or to prevent somebody from doing something they otherwise would do, right? So every tax creates distortions in the marketplace. We need a tax system with the fewest distortions possible. And we need to wrap our head around this basic economic principle. And the basic, and this is just fundamental economics, friends, and that is this, what you tax, you get less of, what you subsidize, you get more of. All right. If you want, if if you pay people to sit on the couch like we did uh, throughout uh, most of, of 2020 and into 2021, you're going to get a significant number of people that are willing to sit on the couch and do nothing and get paid for it. What you tax, you get less of. What you subsidize, you get more of. In our income tax system, we tax employment, wages, production, economic growth, 
This is what the tax is based on. Wages, income, production, economic growth. Is it any surprise that we have stifling effect in wages, income, production, and economic growth? What you tax, you get less of. What you subsidize, you get more of. We need to re we need to release the chains that have bound the engines of economic growth in the United States. We need a system that does not burden the engine of growth. And this is precisely why the founders, during the, the, the structuring of the United States of America, why the founders rejected income taxes and opted for excise taxes as the means of funding the nation. Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary for the United States, specifically said that taxing the articles of our own growth and manufacture are more prejudicial to economic growth and excise taxes. What you tax, you get less of. We don't want to tax income, growth, production, and gains if we need those things to grow the economy. This is why an income tax does not work. And I don't care if it's a flat tax or, or a graduated income tax. It doesn't, or it doesn't make any difference. It's still an income tax. It's still a tax on the engine of economic growth. Whereas a national retail sales tax or sales tax is an excise tax on consumption, does not penalize growth. So we've got to get the, we got to get, we have to get the foot of the tax system off the neck of economic growth. And we do that with a broad-based sales tax. And speaking of broad-based, that brings me to number eight on my list. Number eight, broad-based tax system. The, the tax has to, listen, economists will tell you that you don't raise revenue by raising rates. You raise revenue by spreading the base. You get the base spread out as far as you possibly can. That allows you to have the lowest rate possible to then collect the revenue that's needed for the, uh, to fund the legitimate functions of government. Our tax base is an income tax base, but the base is shrinking. Every year that goes by, friends, there are more people that are taken off the tax rolls than, than, uh, than were the year before. And Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is a perfect example of that. Millions of lower income people were taken off the tax rolls with new credits and expanded credits and so on. And you know the the leftists are very fond of saying that the that Trump's tax law was tax cuts for the rich. That's demonstrably false. It's demonstrably false. The top, the top, uh, uh, I should say, the bottom eighty percent of income earners. So from the eighty percent level down, either saw no change in their tax liability, or saw their taxes reduced. And and as I said, many of the of, of the lower income folks were taken off the tax rolls entirely. It was only the top 20% that saw an increase in their tax liabilities. So it's demonstrably false that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was tax cuts for the risk. It, it, it's just simply false. But it is also true that because we've got more and more people taken off the tax rolls, what we have is fewer and fewer people that are being asked to pay a growing percentage of the burden. All right, you've got more and more people or, uh, that, that, are, that are getting a free ride, fewer and fewer people are paying in, uh, in, in uh, uh, the, the top 20%, right now the top 20% of income earners pay about 36% of all the taxes paid. The top 10% pay about 70% of everything that's paid and the bottom 50% of income earners don't pay less than 2% of the taxes. All right, this is exactly the wrong thing to do if we wanna keep the rates low. You got to spread the base. Everybody needs to have skin in the game because the more people you have that are voting for benefits from the federal government without having to pay for them, the more difficult it's going to be to stop federal spending. I call it the Disney World syndrome. All right. And here's what I mean by that. My wife and I raised four children. If we had to have a Democratic vote every month on how to spend our monthly budget, we would have been in economic catastrophe inside of a year. All right, show of hands. How many want to pay the mortgage this month? Two hands go up, husband and wife, right? How many want to go to Disney World this month? Four hands go up. All the kids want to go to Disney World. They don't know or care about a mortgage payment because they don't have skin in the game. 
People vote for benefits they don't have to pay for, and that means it's a never-ending gravy train. We have to have every citizen with skin in the game, friends. If we adopt a broad-based national retail sales tax, consumption tax, everybody pays something at the point of purchase. Everybody then has a vested interest in keeping the spending down, which in key, which in turn keeps the rate down. And when we've got and when we've got that broad base, the rate can be low to start with. All right. So that brings me to my next point on the list: equality. Equality. Everybody should be treated equally. Is that a radical proposition in the United States of America these days that everybody should be treated equally? The second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence says that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We, this concept of equality is the crowning jewel of American liberty. This is the concept that Abraham Lincoln pounded on during his candidacy for president to abolish slavery. This idea that we are all created equal. Now people are, but under our income tax system, everybody is treated differently. Everybody is treated differently based on their family status and their economic status. We got six different filing classes under our internal revenue code, six, uh, five different filing statuses, six different definitions of the word child. We got seven different tax brackets that are completely arbitrary. It's a graduated income tax. So the higher up you go in income, the greater percentage of tax that you pay. And this these tax brackets are completely arbitrary, friends, and they always have been arbitrary. Now, the, the now the the the, the, uh, the uh, uh, so so we we have got a tax system that is grounded on the proposition of invidious discrimination. We discriminate against people based on their social and economic standing. We wouldn't tolerate that in any other area of law. Can you imagine our criminal justice system? being being uh, uh, meeting out justice on the basis of a chart, a published chart that says if you're if your wealth and your income is this, then you get this kind of treatment under the law. And if your wealth and your income is this, then you get some other treatment under the under the criminal statutes. And we've got six or seven or eight different brackets that establish how you're going to be treated under the criminal law. People would lose their minds and rightfully so. And yet we embrace invidious discrimination in our tax code as though it's some sort of a high-minded positive attribute that we should embrace. Friends, the concept of invidious discrimination under the tax code is built into the system through the graduated income tax laws, which are a Marxist proposition. Marx second plank of his manifesto was a heavy graduated income tax, not for the purposes of, of funding programs for the poor, it's for the purposes of destroying the ownership of wealth in the hands of private people and transferring that wealth to the federal government. And we've got an entire uh, population of leftists now and, and a good number of them in Congress that are embracing these ideas that, you know, we got too many people out there with too much money that they shouldn't have. And so we need to take it away from them. And this is invidious discrimination, friends. There is no lawful authority to take money from people who, are, who earned it legally and peacefully and give it to anybody else under any means just because someone in government thinks that they have too much. It's outrageous, it's illegal, and it's unconstitutional. And that brings me to my next point, number 10, final point, constitutionality. Point 10, constitutionality. We should tax only for legitimate purposes under the United States Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution provides just three purposes for the federal government, for Congress to raise taxes. Number one is to provide for the debts of the nation. That's simple enough. Number two, to provide for the national defense. That's simple enough. Number three is where it gets tricky because number three says that Congress can impose taxes for the, for the general welfare to promote the general welfare. Well, what does that mean? Uh, the, the leftists would tell you that that's welfare, that that's the, that's the provision of government benefits to segments of society that can't take care of themselves. All of these laundry list of benefit programs that we all know about fall under the quote unquote welfare clause. All right, the, that, but the, the problem is this, that is, a, that is an illegitimate definition of the, prof, of, of the welfare clause. 
All right, our founders never would have used the term welfare to describe a government benefit program. They would have used the word relief. A government relief program is available to take government money and or to, to take tax revenue and provide benefits to people on the low end of the economic spectrum. And these were carried out by local governments and state governments long before there ever was a federal government in this country. And after there was a federal government in this country, states and local governments did that very thing. And there's nothing unconstitutional. Uh, uh, well, generally speaking, there's nothing unconstitutional for a state to, to, uh, to adopt uh, to adopt these relief programs. But there's no authority under the general welfare clause to do that because the word general means broad, absolute equal apl application across the board in its entirety. That's how the word general welfare is taken to mean. General well-being, broad-based well-being. So federal spending has to be focused on the broad-based well-being of everybody, not specific segments of society at the expense of others. All right. A perfect example of this would be an interstate road system. Our federal government funded an interstate road system in the 50s through the 60s. And that interstate road system even affected the general welfare of every citizen in this country. In the United States of America, in the state of Minnesota, in January, I can eat fresh grapes from California because they were trucked in on an interstate on an interstate road system. All right, you see this, this benefits everybody. Whereas, whereas taxes that are used to fund specific benefit programs for individuals do not fall within that purview. In the Supreme Court case, United States versus Butler, 1937, United States versus Butler, the Supreme Court addressed this welfare clause. And the court, the court stated that a tax in the general understanding of the term and as used in the constitution signifies an exaction for the support of government. The word, now listen to this now, the word has never been thought to connote the expropriation of money from one group for the benefit of another. That is not what the welfare clause is all about, but it's been twisted. It's been twisted. And now when you take money from, run, from, from one group of people and provide it to another, that is essentially theft. That's what it is. And it's an illegitimate use of the taxing power of the United States. And I'll tell you this, friends, as long as we've got more and more non-producers that are voting for, 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 uh, for benefit programs paid out, out of the federal out of the federal welfare out of the, out of the federal treasury, there will never be enough money to provide for all of this. All right, we've got to focus on the constitutional purpose of tax revenue at the federal level, or there simply will never be enough money to provide for all these benefits. Now, these 10 principles of tax policy, I talked about in my paper, uh, the uh, 10 principles of federal tax policy. This was published by, <laughs> this was published by the Heartland, uh, the Heartland uh, Institute. Uh, the, the, the paper is available on my website, which is taxhelponline.com. So if you go to taxhelponline.com, you'd see my resources. The 10 principles is one of them. And the other thing we did at Heartland is they produced a book called The Patriot's Toolbox. And The Patriot's Toolbox is, uh, is, a, um, is a, uh, a book that consists of, of, of 10 different chapters. Each chapter is written by an expert in his particular field, healthcare, energy, elementary education, higher education, privatization, firearms, telecommunications. I wrote the chapter in the book on federal tax policy. And it's a significantly expanded version of the 10 principles. And that book is available from uh, Heartland Institute. Heartland.org is their website. Heartland.org is their website. So um, th those, are my, th those, are, those are my thoughts in a nutshell, uh, friends. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you're here. And Charlie, we can take some questions if you like. Indeed, and I've raised my hand, and folks, if you look at the reactions tab around the Zoom controls, you should be able to see the raise hand icon. I did see some questions in chat, so if you wouldn't mind raising your hand to ask those questions, uh, we have until new, uh, one o'clock, um, so I'll, get, I'll be quick here. Um, you mentioned two 
problems around uh, hurting the engine of economic growth and another uh, being a tool of corporate of congressional corruption, the congressional currency buying and exchanging favors. Uh, it would seem to me that those two provisions would allow for a real sales tax effort now. I mean, recession is scaring people. Um, people from the COVID nonsense know how corrupt government government is. Uh, we know about the deep state. Um, maybe those two points would generate momentum to really push this idea. What do you think? Yeah, I think they would, and and, uh, and partic particularly the, the buying and selling in favor. And everybody knows it goes on. Everybody knows that Congress is loaded up with lobbyists, and, and this is this is one of the problems with uh, with special benefits doled out to this group or that group under the tax system. Look, Charlie, you know this better than I do. When, whenever whenever buying and selling becomes dependent on legislation, the first thing that gets the first thing that gets bought and sold are legislators. And, and this is why you need a broad based retail sales tax on all consumption goods and services with no exemptions. I know that ruffles people's feathers, but if you start introducing exemptions, well, we're going to exempt healthcare, we're going to exempt food, we're going to exempt this or that. Now you open up the floodgates for the lobbyists to pour in and buy and sell legislative favors and get their, get their particular industry with some benefit under the law that some other industry doesn't have. And that just drives the rate up for everybody else. Jim, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, great talk. Um, I think you're racist, though, Dan. Clearly, <laughs> you know. Uh, and a little more passion. It, it, it used it, it used to be, it used to be that you were a racist if you believed that one race was superior to another simply because of the race, with no other factors involved. Right? That made you a racist. Now, if you want to keep your own money, you're a racist. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it seems to me you, you didn't, uh, or maybe I missed it, talk much about going with a, a, a national sales tax and how it how that works out, you know, and that, that's an easy way to implement a fair tax system. Um, so I'm guessing that the dollars there, there's plenty if you do have a national sales tax that could go in and basically cover this. And I, I also wanted to jump back. If that's the case, then it seems to me the only reason that we have this whole convoluted uh, IRS system is for control and fear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then the second part is, um, I, I have seen and heard that there's a lot of controversy or some controversy in, in our circles about uh, the fact that, that uh, the 16th Amendment was not actually properly ratified. You know, I, I guess you can't fight the cabal with that, but anyway. any, any well, well, let me, let me just comment on that. that yeah. there, there, was, there was a great deal of work that was done uh, by the name of, uh, by, uh, done by a guy named Bill Benson on that. He, he wrote two different books, uh, right. well, well, one book, two volumes, The Law That Never Was, uh, where he documented the, the fact that, uh, that uh, Flander Knox, the Secretary of State in, in 1913, falsified, uh, uh, falsified ratification documents that came from the various states uh, and, and showed that the states never, never did ratify the 13th Amendment. I think he's right. The problem is the case was litigated over and over again in the federal courts. And the federal courts just basically abstained. That's exactly what they did. They said it was a political question. They abstained from ruling on it. And, and, so, and so there, you know, there it sits. So that's a non-starter, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as far as, as, far as the, uh, what, was, what was your first observation of sales tax? Um, yeah, if, sure. if that's so easy and, and fair, the only reason that we're not getting that must the be control. the fear and the control. control. No. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. You're, you're exactly correct. There's, there's no question about it. Control is a major factor because this tax system allows Congress, allows Washington to pick winners and losers in the marketplace. They can, you know, whoever happens to be the golden boy at this time in terms of industry gets the benefits. Who's ever not the golden boy gets punished. And that, of course, is flip-flopping all the time. We see it now with energy with the Biden administration. But, you know, just wait two more years and it's going to change into something else, yeah. I'm sure. And, and, and that is the, that is just one of the nefarious elements of this tax system that we have now is the control that it gives to Washington and they don't want to give it up. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Rocky. 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 Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, it's a great presentation. I, my question was about uh, in regards to the uh, increasing number of wealthy Americans or even just average Americans I guess, escaping and renouncing citizenship in no small part due to taxes. 
Sure. Um, what are the odds that the pendulum might swing into a more oppressive taxation regime under the guise of uh, you know stopping the one percent from escaping and, and paying not, not paying their fair share? What are your thoughts on that? Well, well as a matter of fact, we already have that. Uh, th th there already is a, a pretty significant oppressive reaction of the tax system to anybody that expatriates. I mean, for example, if you if you expatriate, you give up your citizenship, there is an immediate capital gains tax on all on all unrealized capital gains on every piece of property that you own. So whether you sell the property or not, you've got that immediate capital gains tax. And there's a number of other things. So Congress already reacted to this in the uh, the middle part of the of the of the the first part of this century, 2004 or five, I believe is when these changes came in. I'd have to go back and look, it doesn't matter. But the fact is that's exactly why they put them in to try to, to, try to uh, keep these top income earners from making a run for it. But the fact of the matter is it's gonna get worse. There's just no doubt about it. And you know, this is an essential part of our tax base. These people are consumers. And even if you set aside the income tax system and, and, you, and you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't take a significant uh, share of the income from the, from the 1%, they still spend money and they spend a lot of it. And when you got a broad based retail sales tax, you capture much more than you otherwise would. Charlie, you got uh, Rocky, any follow up or I'll ask a question. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great answer. Um, an another reason that might generate interest in, you know, moving uh, to tax sales and not income is, not just the, the fear we have with recession or the disgust we have with congressional corruption and corporate welfare, but also that point about um, database access you mentioned where uh, they wanna access all the databases just like big tech w wants to and big government uh, to control you. Um, I mean, whether it's the vaccine passport, the carbon footprint, the government digital currency, it seems to me that that point that you raised, Dan, fits right into that concern, the database access, which, you know, they want to have for monetization and behavioral control. Um, how do you think people are waking up to that general threat from all these different angles where, hey, the IRS is in on it? That's also another reason to move beyond the scurry income tax scheme no. and go to a sales tax? No, Charlie, I don't think people are waking up to that at all. All you got to do is look at Facebook. And look at all the things that putting their uh, people are putting on their Facebook pages and their and their and their social media sites. You know, I, I went on this vacation. I went on that vacation. I went. I mean, just imagine uh, you're you're going into a tax audit now. The IRS is looking at your tax return, and you report thirty five thousand dollars worth of income on your tax return. The, I'm, I guarantee you. I promise you, and I know this for a fact that they're checking social media accounts to the fullest extent possible of any of their audit targets. And so one of the questions that's going to be on the auditor's sheet is you say you're making 35 grand a year, but here you went to Las Vegas and then you went to and then you went to San Diego and then you went to Florida. Well, how is that done on thirty five thousand dollars worth of income? So there's no question that that people are not waking up to it, at least in so far as their social media accounts are concerned. But you might agree that we should probably raise that threat, the database access. Oh, as absolutely, no question. Reason. I think it's a real thing, and I think that I think that should concern people. And I think if they understand the scope of it, it would concern people. In in in, in my I mentioned in my book how to win your tax audit. I got an entire chapter in that. Uh, front end of that book on exactly how this front end tax system is designed to work. And the IRS is making more and more progress every day going toward it. You know, this idea that the IRS is operating on 1960s computer technology is absolute nonsense. It's, it's total B as in B, S as in S. They've spent billions of dollars on computer upgrades. They've got artificial intelligence now that just launched here uh, a couple of weeks ago that, that allow you to engage in quote unquote chat bots with the IRS to get this problem solved or that problem solved. You know how that's going to work, I can imagine, uh, or not work, I should say, I can imagine. But, but you know, they, they've, they've got growing technology that allows them to reach into these uh, resources of these databases. They've also got contracts with private companies. I've written about this. My articles have been published on this issue of how IRS is going to amass this massive amount of data. And they've sp they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on outside contractors to allow them to build program to build programs for the IRS to allow them to assimilate and, and deploy this data that they're collecting. Scary. Last hey, question, Rocky. Go ahead, Jim. Hey, wait, just before you get there, Rocky, I was going to say, maybe, uh, Dan, we should follow uh, 
Sri Lanka's reform policy. What do you think? <laughs> okay, uh, Rocky, go ahead. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, guys. Um, I'll be quick. So, in regards to the database access and the um, those growing uh, tech tools, would any of that? It seems like they're building like a, a profile on us um, on our tax situation. Would some of that be, or any of it, or all of it, be accessible? Um, in regards to like Freedom of Information Act, we could request yeah, yeah, profiles or request information on those databases. Yeah, you can certainly make a Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act request for, for whatever records the IRS has on you. And as far as uh, general FOIA requests for this information, um, you know, that's essentially been done. And my, the article, uh, the, and I, I can send the link for that article to Charlie here when we're done, you guys can get that out. Um, but but uh, the, 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 the that, that's how we discovered this in the first place, was FOIA uh, request to get the information. Gotcha, thank okay. you. Okay, so let's close with a final thought, Dan, and also how folks can reach you. Yeah, you can reach me at uh, my website, taxhelponline.com. It's all one word, no spaces of any kind, taxhelponline.com. I would encourage everybody to read my, uh, my uh, treatise, The 10 Principles of Federal Tax Policy, and get it to your state legislatures. I think we got to, my, my, my analysis here now, my, the bottom line for me is I think we got to pick the states off one at a time, get rid of the state income taxes, adopt the broad-based real, real estate, uh, real, uh, a broad-based retail sales tax at a state level. And I think we do that to push the federal government. That's the, that's the place I'm at in my mind with this now. So what about your wealth? If your money could actually talk to you, would you listen to it? Well, with the DNA Network Academy, your money actually can talk to you. And it's gonna tell you just what it told this client. This family had over 24 debts, mortgages, car loans, the works. They were on track to take 20 years to pay it all off and instead did it in 8.5. Plus they did it without refinancing, making more money or even changing their lifestyle. So find out for yourself with a free analysis that is completely confidential. No personal information, no social security numbers, no credit checks, none of that nonsense. But what is exciting is that the outcome of that report you receive is a guaranteed outcome for you. To get that report, head on over to bit.ly forward slash debt to wealth. You will arrive at this simple form, fill it in, as simple as lender number one and credit card number two. What really matters is the accuracy of your numbers. You'll be able to see that if instead of 20 years or whatever your number is, that you may actually be out of debt and on your way to wealth in as little as 6.3 years like this client. 